Well, let's get started. So we've um, sort of made a hard transition last time. I don't know if you really um, picked up on, you may or may not have picked up on what we did, right? So the start of last class, I talked about abstract geometry, right? And tried to show you some of the, the standing questions of Euclidean geometry and how, um, and I alluded to the fact that ultimately logic alone, right, the synthetic approach to geometry couldn't convincingly dispatch the idea that Euclidean geometry was the only geometry. In fact, um, there were you know, somewhat famous philosophers who basically said something along the lines of, Euclidean geometry is the only one you can imagine. And um, well, he was wrong. Uh, in fact, you can imagine many other geometries, and I showed you an example of one last time, the uh, hyperbolic geometry on the upper half plane, right? So that was just an uh, appetizer, so to speak, to get us started. And then I turned to the problem of trying to describe the idea of tangent space and normal space. I started by showing you um, how to think about those things concretely in terms of either differentiating a parameterization, right, or differentiating the level curves. So if we differentiate the level functions, which define the space as a level set, the derivatives of those level functions give us vectors, which are normal, vector fields actually, which are normal to the, the space involved, right? So if you pick a particular point, you can take all those uh, gradient vectors and evaluate them at the point. Those will give you a basis for the normal space to the point. On the flip side, if you have a parameterization for the space and you calculate the derivatives with respect to the parameters of the parameterization, you plug in the point, those will give you vectors which lie in the tangent space. The tangent space and the normal space, these are perpendicular, um, and the sum of their dimensions is n. So like how big the normal space is depends on how big the ambient context is. In three dimensions, the normal space to a curve is two-dimensional. In three dimensions, the normal space to a surface is one-dimensional, right? You can talk about a normal line. Um, but in four dimensions, the normal space to a curve would be three-dimensional. The normal space to a two-dimensional surface in four dimensions is itself two-dimensional. We did an example like that last time. So like normal space depends on the context of where you are, right? But the tangent space, on the other hand, reflects the intrinsic dimension of the, the surface or manifold we're looking at. It doesn't matter what dimension curve you're in, what dimension a curve is in, the tangent space to a curve is one dimensional, it's a line, right? It doesn't matter what dimension you embed a two-dimensional surface in, the tangent space is two-dimensional. So like these are things we're going to keep seeing and, um, uh, and it may be a little bit confusing as I gave you problems to look at, right? And, you feel like you're missing something because I haven't really done these things systematically. I just showed you an example, right? I didn't define a general theory and build things, did I? So, so um, <clears throat> that's just a, just a backdrop to where we are. So then at the end of last class, I started talking about the tangent space in an abstract sense, right? I said the tangent space we should understand is the set of derivations at a point of the smooth functions, right? So. Essentially, what we learned last class was the tangent space to P at M is the span of like partial, partial x1 at P and so forth and so on. Partial xn at P. So that would be the tangent space. And then I also talked about the cotangent space, PPM star. And I mentioned that that one, you can form um, the differentials, dx1, dx2. I don't know why I'm including the second one here, but not up there. Fine, I'll be symmetric in my listing. Give me a second here. My bad. Um, and maybe I should slap a sub p somewhere, because this is at the point p. I debate whether I should put it here or at the end. I mean, I'm not. You look at a different set of notes I write different years, you'll find the P either here or there. <clears throat> anyway, those are differentials, right? Um, and um, these, these, are, these are dual, right? We talked about um, definition. What was our definition? If F was from, um, Uh, 
a subset of the Rn. So like, I suppose the domain of f, subset of Rn, to R, I defined df um, at the point p as a uh, the so-called differential of f at p, and it was an element of um, tpm star, and I and I said we define that in particular as follows: dpf acts on a vector v according to the rule v acts on f, right? And you just got done doing homeworks, which hopefully make this expression less bizarre, right? You now have a better sense of what I mean by that. V is a partial derivative or a linear combination of partial derivatives. And so V of F really just means take that derivative operator and act on F, you know? Okay. Uh, the star, this denotes um, dual space. It's a linear algebra thing. Dual space. So like, um, it's the set of linear maps from the vector space to the underlying field. So like, um, dual space of a vector space. It's a set of linear transformations which take in vectors and spit back out numbers. So it's like functions from the vector space to the reals. That's what the dual space is. Yeah, and that's what this does. See, um, so let me be more obnoxious. This is the vector field where? The vector field in the tangents, this is <clears throat> for all, um, good grief, V, and I really maybe should put a sub P just to be totally annoying. Um, it's a vector at the tangent, I mean, this is a vector at P, right? Let's see here. Um, let me be less abstract for just a second here. Example. F could be, say, x squared y plus z cubed, right? And um, in that case, um, d, p, f of v, right, would be equal to v of that, right? But can we break that down further? I mean, we could write V as a sum of its components too, right? Like your problem five kind of explored that idea. So V, we could write as like V1 partial. Now, my apologies. Um, I have um, closed my mind off the higher dimensions after the line. Like this example is in what dimension? This is in dimension three. So here I'm thinking N equals to three. All right. So in n equals to three, I don't need x1, y, x1, x2, x3, right? I can use x, y, z for the coordinates, right? And sometimes he does in the book, and sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes I do in my notes, and sometimes I don't. Uh, you know, like if I want to use a summation, I like to have x1, x2, x3 because I can say it's like sum i equals one to three, right? So fine. But um, here, oops, we write the one up. So what happens as this hit x, x squared y plus z cubed, right? Yeah, we get v1 times 2xy plus v2 times x squared, right? plus v3, three, yeah, 3z three squared, right? And there you go. That's actually how that would work out for that function. What it's describing is how it's describing something about the rate of change of the function in the direction of the vector is, is what that's telling you about. 
All right. Going back to our discussion of directional derivative last time. All right, so um, let's see here. And um, I mentioned, but I don't think I wrote down, actually I'm not going to write it down, but the differential has nice properties, like the differential of a sum is the sum of the differentials. Um, there's a product rule for differentials. Um, there's a chain rule for differentials, all these things. Okay. Now, moving on here. <clears throat> now for the more new material, we talk about the wedge product. And um, so I could jump straight into the um, differential, like I could straight, jump straight into the application of the, the wedge product to uh, differential geometry, like we could do that directly. But I think what will be more understandable to you guys is if I just take about 10 minutes here and try to introduce the wedge product to you in a more like abstract algebraic way. And so what I mean by that is I'm going to claim that there's a way we can take vectors, all right, and we can combine them to make new things that we would call two vectors or three vectors or four vectors by wedging them. So like the wedge product is, um, what, it's, what it's going to do is it, it is a um, associative distributive um, you know uh, product of uh, vectors um, subject a um, anti-commutation rule so here's the thing and we write we use wedge for this new project right so you should think about this in kind of the same way you think about a cross product in calculus it's some new thing to do with vectors right but at the same time, you shouldn't think of it as a cross product from calculus three because the wedge product of two vectors is not a vector again. It's something else. So for example, if we have V, maybe V is a bad letter. Um, let's say vector, oh, I'll use A. Vector A wedged with vector B, the, the, the quintessential rule about the wedge product is that when you take the wedge product of two vectors, it's minus if you flip it over. In other words, it's minus B wedge A. This is essentially like one of the fundamental defining rules for the wedge product, all right? Now, I'm not going to be super careful. Like, if you want to be super careful, you could take a very abstract algebraic approach. You could build like a universal object, and you could divide by the relations that you want, and you can define this thing in that kind of like there's a, there's a way to build these things from scratch, right? We don't really care about that. What I want to talk about is how to think about them formally, right? So, um, you know, let's see here. R2. What can we do with wedge products in R2? We have, what's the basis for R2? It's E1 and what? E1 and E2, right? So what's E1 wedge E1 equal to? I mean, actually, I could have done this back up here at the general level. I could have said, hey, check it out. A wedge A is equal to what? Minus A wedge A. What's that say about A wedge A? It says that 2 times A wedge A is equal to 0, right? which as long as you're not working in characteristic two, implies that A wedge A is zero. We are not working in characteristic two. We will be working in characteristic, do you guys know what characteristic is? So characteristic, um, so there are fields 
other than the real numbers, where you can add the number one to itself a finite number of times and get zero. That's called the character. If you can't do that, if no matter how many times you add one to itself, you don't get zero, then it's said to be a characteristic zero field. Rational numbers, real numbers, complex numbers, these are all characteristic zero fields. If you take integers mod a prime, like you got, some of you are in abstract algebra, right? So one of the things you'll do is look at like z mod 2 or z mod 3. In fact, z mod a prime, you'll eventually learn, is in fact a field. It's a finite field. And it has characteristic p. So like in z mod 2, if you add 1 plus 1, you get 2, but 2 is 0. See, so the number 1 in z mod 2, you can add to itself twice, and you're back to 0 again. This is annoying, and it, it breaks calculus. That's, yeah, I mean, that, essentially the definition of characteristic is the, well, there's a more formal definition, but pragmatically speaking, the number of times you can add one, if you can add one to itself a finite number of times and get zero, whatever that finite number of times is, is the characteristic. So if, if, you, have, if you add one to itself three times and get zero, it's a characteristic three field. If no matter how many times you add one to itself, you don't get zero, it's characteristic zero. This should be the last time I talk about characteristic in this course <laughs> because we are decidedly in characteristic zero. Sorry. Um, anyway, so A wedge A is zero. So E1 wedge E1 is what? Zero. And what about E2 wedge E2? Same song and dance, right? So what else do you have? You can do E1 wedge E2, right? That doesn't have to be zero, and in fact, that is not zero, essentially by construction. That's, well, it is all equal to minus E2 wedge E1. Okay, great. That's kind of about all you can do. Why can't you have three things? Let's suppose you take three vectors, right? Like E1 wedge E2, let's do wedge E1. Then what happens? Why is that zero? So I told you the product was distributive. What that means is you, and it's associative, right? So it doesn't matter whether you do which one, which of the wedges you do first. But I'm going to do, this is E1 wedge minus E1 wedge E2. So I just flip flop the last two, right? And now by associativity, I can, in distributivity, I can pull the minus out. And I get E1 wedge E1, which is what? That's zero. And so, <laughs> and that's, that's zero. Because one of the consequences of distributivity is that if you have the zero form, excuse me, the zero vector, and you wedge it with other things, it wedges to zero. That's a consequence of distributivity. So in some sense, this is kind of, kind of boring. For R2, you can talk about the exterior algebra of R2, and you've got stuff like, basically, it's the span of these things. Things like the number 1, E1, E2, and E1 wedge E2. You either have zero vectors, one vectors, or you could have a two vector, and that's, that's it. If you take a linear combination of these things, and you wedge them together, you get things of the same form. That's what the wedge product looks like in two dimensions. Let me show you what this has to do with determinants. Right? Let's look at what it has to do with determinants. What's the determinant? You guys remind me, what's the determinant of A, B, C, D? Oh, you're thinking of the inverse. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're, you're giving me a more complicated thing. Uh, no, it's, uh, AD minus BC. Yeah, 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 yeah. AD minus BC. Now, what does that have to do with the wedge product? So let's be, let me show you. How, let me show it. Let me let me show you. So check this out. If we take a, let's let a be the matrix A B C D, right? What is, what is A times E1? What is A times E2? Um, 
is, it's AC, right? Oh, not, not zero, no, no. AE1 is the first column of A. Is the, is the second column A, yes. When we multiply a matrix on the right by the standard basis, we pick off columns. So generally speaking, like this is just a generic, generic linear algebra comment, A times EI, that is the ith column of A. That is a general truth of linear algebra, matrix theory if you like. So, okay, so what's AE1 wedge AE2? See, that would be AE1, little AE1, plus CE2, right? Wedged with, I'm rewriting these as sums of the unit vectors. This is BE1 plus DE2, right? Now, distribute. Multiply that out. What do you get? You guys, work it out. Like some of these things are zero, right? E1 wedge E1 is zero. E2 wedge E2 is zero. So we can ignore those. We get, well, we get A times D. What? A, D, E1, E wedge E2, plus C, B, E2, wedge E1. But let's flip the order of E1 and E2. Let's, let's put them both as E1 wedge E2. So that gets me a what? That gets me a minus on the second term, right? And what is that? Right. So this anti-commutivity of the wedge product paired with its distributive property is just the right secret sauce to derive, to encode the derivative, excuse me, the determinant in terms of a, in terms of a product. It's not, an all, it's not at all an exaggeration to say that the wedge product is the determinant. And the determinant is the wedge product. Like that's not too much of a lie. Ah. For all n is the question. Well, yeah, so here's, the, the wedge product is better than the determinant. And the reason I say that is that we can only take the determinant of what? Of a square matrix, right? But you can take the wedge product of as many vectors as you like. And um, in short, if the wedge product of a bunch of vectors is non-zero, <laughs> they're uh, linearly independent. If the wedge product of vectors is zero, <laughs> They're linearly dependent. That's kind of nice, right? Do you remember that from linear algebra? Oh, if you want to check the vectors, linear dependence or independence, just take the wedge product of them. You shouldn't remember it. It's not something we taught you. <laughs> it's not commonly thought of that way. There is a linear algebra book which does everything from the perspective of wedge products, but it's actually rather, it's not an easy path. <laughs> um, I think that, well, anyway, the rest of my sentence is probably one of your homework problems, but let's look at three dimensions, right? What would this look like? How does it, so what's the, what I'm trying to tell you is you can make a definition of determinant in terms of wedge products if you want. Um, If I got every, I guess I was in, I don't know if I was in frame or not. This is bad. <laughs> um, so here's, I mean, here's a, well, definition. Um, a, or it's a theorem. I mean, it depends on where you start. AE1 wedge AE2 
wedge da 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 wedge a e n is equal to the determinant of a times e one wedge e two wedge e n. So, in this sense, the wedge product and the determinant are linked. Uh, you could do wedge product of row vectors if you wanted instead. And we'll do, we're actually going to be doing wedge products of covectors mostly in here. Wedge products of covectors are called differential forms. That ties into your concept of differential from calculus 3. Like remember we talked about like differential of a function. We can extend that to talk about differential forms. That's what we'll be doing soon. Um, and th see, how about R3? What's, what's? Depending on uh, how things rows have what matters to the form, you have three columns, you use the wedge product and you figure it out. It'll give you a unique determinant or um, what, what would you say is the cloud forming? Like, would you still call it a determinant? Uh, no, I mean, I can, I can take the wedge. So check it out. So like if, um, <laughs> if I had, um, one, 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 and I, let me make it simpler, one, one, zero, and I had, you know, two, two, zero. Those are pretty clearly linearly dependent, right? So if I call this thing V, I can call this thing 2V, right? So what's V wedge 2V equal to? It's 2 times V wedge V, right? I regret using V as a variable here. <laughs> you, let me put something on the V so it doesn't look so much like an upside down wedge. Yes. I'm good? All right, well. Anyway, the point is zero. Uh, so that's how you determine if it's dependent or not. You could. That's one way. Cool. But it's, it's, <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, Go for it. Mm -hmm. It's because the wedge product is such that when we take a vector wedge a vector, we get minus what we started. So like I said A wedge B is minus B wedge A. So if A is equal to B, we get that, right? But that means that A wedge A is zero. So like this is a fundamental fact in this exterior algebra. Exterior algebra is the word we use to describe like the general algebraic technique I'm talking about here. It's, the, it's all of this together. The reason it's called exterior is because you start with a vector space, but you're adding new things to it. It's beyond the vector space. It's exterior to it. Um, but yeah, that's because V wedge V is zero. So yeah. <laughs> of course, the proof that it's linearly dependent from linear algebra perspective is just what? It's, it's like it is twice v. It, that's a linear dependence, right? That's like the. So. All right. Um, so we could use this wedge product to describe determinants, or we could take determinants. You could use determinants to de like define the wedge product also. Like that's done in some books. Um, so. I want to talk about I want to talk about the application um, to TP TPM star. So what I mean is, so here um, 
we can talk about what are called zero forms. Um, would be like number. Well, let's see here. Yeah, it'd be like numbers. Um, a covector. Well, let's see here. Oh man, that was. Ouch. All right. Well, now I have. I. Um, this is the thing I always run up run up against in here is, you know, we talk about vectors at a point. We talk about vector fields, right? Um, so. You might want to talk about differential forms at a point or differential form fields. But for whatever reason, we just call them differential forms. But really, differential form field would be a better term for it. Because it's, it's an app, it's, you're giving a differential form at the point for a, a bunch of points together. It's like an assignment of a differential, um, well, a covector is the, so I, I so I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm I'm at a loss for words here. All of a sudden. So let me say zero form, and I, and I almost would put field here. Zero form field is it's a function. A one form is something like a differential. That's a one form. And um, just to be clear, and, and I, might, I might say the word field because it's really more like a vector field than it is a, a vector at a specific point, right? Like what I was doing with the determinant just a second ago, I would think of those as at a specific point. You know, it's not like a, it's not a vector field. It's not a, a two vector field or something like these. This is, I, I'm thinking this to me is like at a point. This, on the other hand, well, a function is what? What does a function do? It gives you, it assigns a number for each point in its domain, right? That's what a function is. So you could also say a function is a number field because it, 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 it assigns a number to each point in its domain, right? And in some sense, a function is a number field. A one form, it assigns a covector um, at each point in its domain. So to be clear here, these alpha 1 through alpha n, these are functions. You know, from let's say Rn to R. So I'm, I'm trying to describe what differential forms look like in Rn. Once I'm done with this like general rundown, then I'm going to drop back to three dimensions and be very explicit about how three dimensions works out, okay? So one form is, so alpha is an function, right? Alpha is a one, one form. Is alpha is a one form, which means it's a linear combination of differentials of the coordinates times these functions. Okay, okay. This, these dx1s through dxn's, these are the things we defined last time. So we could reasonably let this act on a vector field and it would it would give us something did I define that are these essentially like graphs graphs um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that um, they're like vector fields but they're dual to vector fields we'll see more what they are as we go on here but a two form I don't think I don't think I really can say what they are in terms of what you already know. Okay, I think it's a new idea, really. The totality of it's new. A two form, again, it's really a two form field because we're essentially assigning a, a two covector at each point. If you, if I was so foolish as to use that language, um, and, and what that's going to be is something like this. And now here, the combinatorics just gets to be a little bit much. So, so something like this. Beta 1, 2, dx1, wedge dx2. And then what else can you do? How about 1, wedge 3, 1, wedge 4, 1, wedge all the way to n? So this goes on. Beta 1n, dx1, wedge dxn. But that's not all, because what else do you have? 
Well, n1 we don't need because that's just minus what we have already. So as long as we insist that the indices are increasing, if we, if we flip them over, that would just be minus what we already had started. So like we wouldn't need that to form a basis. Those would be linearly dependent on what we already have here. So we don't, n1 we don't need. But we could have, you know, 2. Now 2, 2 I don't need because dx2 wedge dx2 is 0. But I could have, I could have 2, 3. And that continues. So two, one, and one, two, the same thing. Uh, well, usually the notation is beta 1, 2 is minus beta 2, 1. That's like a common. Oh, and that's why they cancel. That's what they well, they don't, I wouldn't say they cancel. We can just combine them. Yeah. Um, but anyway, this is a particular notation for the expansion of a 2 form. Um, and eventually we get the 2n. And this, this, this continues, right? I mean, and on and on and on. How many different ways can you choose two things from n things without repeating? Infinitely many. Eventually we get to beta n minus 1 n dx n minus 1 wedge dx n. How many, how many terms are there there? That's like the problem of combinatorics, right? Here, just for a second, let's just do three dimensions. How many are there in three dimensions? Three, Th three. You're, yeah, you're, yeah. You, you're, you're, you're. You're not wrong. Dx one, dx two. So that'd be like beta one two. One three. I'm sticking with my um, my enumeration there. And then two three, and then you're done. So in three dimensions, there's just three linearly independent two forms at a point. It so happens. In four dimensions, there are six. In n dimensions, there's n choose two. Do you guys know what n choose two is? Like n choose two? Uh-huh. It's exactly that, because that's what we're doing. How many ways can you choose two things from n things without repeating? Oh, yeah. That's what this is. Com combinatorics, yeah. So do you guys remember the formula for that? It's in terms of like factorials and junk. Uh, no, I just remember like NPR or NPC. Well, we can look it up later, but uh, I mean, I, I, I'll mess it up if I just try to write all it off. But the bottom line is, um, for example, 3 choose 2 is equal to 3. <laughs> Um, if you want, you can get these from the uh, Pascal's triangle. Like the numbers in Pascal's triangles are the are the choose numbers. Like this is uh, one, two. Excuse me, zero, one, two, three, four. So like four choose zero is one. Four choose one is four. Four choose two is six. Uh, 4 choose 3 is 4, 4 choose 4 is 1. And that's why in four dimensions there are six linearly independent two forms because there, that's how many different ways you can choose two things without repeating. And you can prove these things are linearly, I'm not, I'm not going to make you prove these things are linearly independent, all right? Like that would force us to define things more carefully than I care to in here. Um, okay, so anyway, uh, you know, so this is very annoying. Like this way of talking about it's very annoying because like who wants to write all that, right? But there is a very nice compact notation for this, which is the following. We can just say beta is equal to the sum over i in i two of n of beta sub i dx i. And so here i is equal to i1 i2. It's a multi-index. 
multi-index is just what it sounds like. It's, a, it's got more than one index in it. And so our notation is just dxi. That's just shorthand for dxi1 wedge dxi2. So with this lovely notation, we can compactly express, express this monstrosity by simply writing, hey, take the sum over all multi-indices of length 2 taken from n things. That's, that's what a 2 form looks like. And once I introduce that notation, you can tell me what a 3 form looks like pretty easily, right? What's a 3 form going to look like? 3 form, something like gamma. In fact, let's just go ahead and jump straight to a k form. What would a k form look like? Sum, because I'm out of chalkboard here, right? Um, I in I sub k n of gamma, gamma sub i dx i. Now, for combinatorial reasons, if you wanted to state this in terms of what are called the tensor components, you could write this alternatively as like the sum i1, um, i2, da da da, ik equals 1 to n of 1 over k factorial, 1 over k factorial, gamma, i1, i2, ik, dx, i1, wedge dx, i2, wedge da da da, wedge dx, ik. So I told some of you before class that I couldn't get a printout of my notes today because um, the printers at school have conspired against me. And I warned you that in the context of this lecture, I would do things I shouldn't do because of a lack of organization. We are definitely there at this moment because that is something I shouldn't have written in here. <laughs> but um, so these are the so-called um, tensor components. I, I'm, but this is a sum over all possible indices. So this would like include 1, 2 versus, and also 2, 1. And the 1 over k accounts for the fact that you're like over counting. I regret writing that. All right, so I hope I've done enough that I can make the following definition. Yeah, yeah. Second. Listen, all I'm really trying to tell you is that we can take the wedge product of. Um, man, I keep getting off camera. Sorry to. Uh, hey, wait a minute. If she was here, she'd be doing it. It's her own fault, right? So, <laughs> no. I'm just kidding. Um, so, in terms of this notation, I can tell you, if we had say gamma is the sum over gamma i dx i. You know, i is say in i k. And suppose we had alpha is the sum over j in I, I don't know, let's say, let's say instead of k, let's say p, and let's let this one be q. Um, what would happen if you took alpha wedge gamma? So what happens is you get like the sum over i and i p, sum over j in the q indices um, of well alpha j gamma i and then dx <coughs> do, 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 which one came first dx j wedge dx i.
At the moment, all I've, at the moment I'm just using the distributivity of the, the wedge product I claimed. And what I want to show you, so this is, so like some language here. This is a P form. This is a Q form. How many things are here? See, Q, and this has P. So this is actually a Q plus P form. So when we take the wedge product of a Q form and a P form, we get a, a Q plus P form. All right? How does this relate to, say, gamma wedge alpha? What if we, can we reverse these? So we can, like the first thing, um, if you don't mind, I'm going to abbreviate that, abbreviate that as just sum over i and sum over j with the understanding I mean what's above. Like the, com the combinatorics here can get to be a drag if you're too explicit. Um, so I can do this. This is gamma i alpha j. Why can I do that? Well, gamma i and alpha j, uh, these are just functions for a specific multi-index, right? So function multiplication commutes. I can commute those. That's not a problem. Now, on the flip side, I can't just, I can't just flip these over, right? Yeah, and so here we're going to have to kind of like blow these up a little bit. And there's going to be a minus, right? But let's, let's kind of expand on this, what's going on here. So what we're looking at is dx j1 wedge dot dot wedge dx. Um, how, many, how many j's are there? Q, right? dx j sub q. And then that's wedged with what? dx i1. Wedge dx, how many i's are there? P, yeah, P, i sub P. So we want to move the i index past the j index. So what we're going to do is we're going to do it one differential at a time. I'll start by moving this guy over to there. So you think about this. I go, I flip this one, then that one, then that one, then that one, then that one. How many flips do I need to get to the front? Now we're DXI2 is this thing that's next there, right? So you guys tell me, how many minus signs do I have to put in there to be fair. Aha, still in the frame. I should really turn this thing over so I can see it. So to move that dx i1 to the front of that list, I had to, I had to like, my first thing I would do is this give, would give me minus dx i1 wedge dx jq. Then that gets me to the jq minus 1. Yeah. Then I flip that over. And I flip and I flip and I flip. It would take me q of them. I would get Q times, Q minuses, right? So what's the formula for that? Minus 1 to the Q. Right? And then, oh, and then I do what? Well, now I've got to bring this DXI2 out front. That, and how many time, how many dx's does it have to go through? How many dxj's does that have to go through? It also has to go through q of them. So I get another minus one to the q from that. And 
And I might as well stop writing it this way and instead write this as what? What's a nice, that's really dx upper j, right? And now we're to three. So now we move the three past the dxj, and it generates a what? Yet another minus one to the q. So how many minus one to the q's do we generate if we bring all of the dxi to the front? How many of these dx minus one, minus one to the q, how many, how, many, how, many, how many times of these? We would have p-fold of these. If you have p copies of minus 1 to the q, what's the formula for that? What if I had two of them? Minus one to the q times minus one to the q, I get minus one to the two q, right? If I had three of them, I get minus one to the three q. If I had four of them, I get minus one to the four q. If I have p of them, I get minus one to the p q, right? So what I have is minus one to the p q, sum over i of alpha i dx i, wedge sum over j, and I've taken the liberty of um, distributing the sums back out again, just to get to the point, because I'm out of chalkboard here. But the, the key thing I did was this right here is minus 1 to the pq dxi wedge dxj. To, s to flip these multi-differentials, it, it costs us a minus 1 to the pq power. which is kind of neat, because what is this? Minus 1 to the pq times what? This is alpha. Oh, come on. What have I done? What have I done? There's actually just one mistake on the board. It's just very upsetting to me that I did it. Can you tell me what my mistake is? Two alphas, right? Which one of these alphas is not an alpha? Um, no. <laughs> that's supposed to be gamma sub i. <sighs> Dummy. Anyway, so that's gamma wedge alpha. And so, there you go. I have proved for you that um, if we take a, you know, basically here's the rule that we just proved. Theorem alpha wedge beta, well, excuse me, alpha wedge gamma is equal to minus 1 to the pq gamma wedge alpha. When they're both one forms, we get a minus relation, right? But this shows you something, right? Like, I, said, I told you a one form wedge of one form is 0. Does it have to be the case that a two form wedge of two form is 0? It, it does not have to happen, right? A two form wedge of two form this equation just gives you, it doesn't give you its, um, like if I had, so can you guys tell me a two form that when you wedge it to itself you get back something that's not zero? How does that happen? Let me do an example. We better go to R4. And I'll, I'll, I'll use our, we, we, we've been doing x, y, z, w in here. Well, let's keep with that. That's a good kind of lazy notation for R4. So how about this? If we take the differential form alpha equal to dx, um, dx wedge dy 
plus dz wedge dw. That's a two form, right? Try taking the wedge product of this with itself. See what you get. Of course, at this point, I'm off the board. So by the way, to let you know where we're going, I'm hoping to like wrap up the differential form discussion in here um, in about another 40 minutes or so probably. And then we'll take like a 15 minute break and then hopefully we're gonna end at nine again, maybe a little bit before, depending on how things go, okay? Is that, is that a good pattern or do we need to take? Um, so I'm, a, I'm attempting to tell, ah, good grief. I'm attempting to tell you the things in my notes here um, what I've just gone through, ah, that's funny. So on page, page 11, I had the good sense to do this calculation for one forms. <laughs> so I did this calculation for one forms on page 11 of the notes. In here, because I'm an idiot, I just did the calculation for arbitrary P and Q forms. <coughs> so if you're a little bit confused right now, my apologies. I am trying to get back on the straight and narrow. I will, I will do it eventually. Actually, this proof is, <coughs> oh no, the chalk is getting to me. This proof is, I think, at the bottom of page 12. Um, so when you're doing the wedge product, do you use the wedge product on the end, like kind of drop off? Um, well, that's just a notation. This dxj actually means oh, all of that. Yeah. Oh, this one. I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah, so like anytime there's a differential, uh, a differential repeated, that's zero, right? So the only, the only hope here is to get unique set. And, and, and what are we going to be looking? We're going to be looking for a four form, right? So yeah, this with this is zero. This with this is zero. We yeah, have dx wedge dy wedge dz wedge dw plus the other way around. But the cool thing here is that those don't cancel out because when you move the dx wedge dy over here, the dx moves past two things, so it goes minus one, minus one. The dw goes past two things, goes minus one, minus one. You have a net of four minuses, which gives you a plus. And so sum total two dx wedge dy wedge dz, wedge dw. So yeah, there's a, a sample calculation. Now, so um, listen, to do these things carefully in the same kind of care and rigor that you maybe would do in abstract algebra or, or a good linear algebra course, you could easily spend a month developing this material. All right. And if you're going into math and this is the kind of math you want to do, you should do that. You should do it carefully. You should spend time on it. And there are wonderful books which do that carefully. Um, for example, John Lee's manifold, Smooth Manifolds book or um, Jeffrey Lee's um, you know, Differential Geometry book. Those are both um, fantastic books that have like all of the, well, especially Jeffrey Lee's book has the gory combinatorics of this. Just it's all there. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a 800 page book or something like that. And there's a 900 page appendix 